being a realtor is one of the best professions that you could possibly choose because you can do anything with it. You can structure your business any way you want to give you a certain lifestyle that you want. But it starts with understanding what the possibilities are and what different types of business structures there are, what different brokerages can do for you, and what you can actually expect as a lifestyle. When I started out in this industry 10 years ago as an agent, I thought that literally the only path to success was start selling a bunch of homes personally, then become a broker, then launch my own brokerage. I didn't understand that there's other ways to do that. So today we're talking with Justin Conico, the head of prime real estate brokerage up in London, Ontario, Canada, who has a very unconventional brokerage, something that your brokerage is nothing like. And he's gonna describe how they set it up and why. And you know, if you're looking to do that yourself, great. But my goal today is to help you as a real estate agent, whether you're brand new or you've been in the industry for 30 years, to start thinking about what kind of lifestyle you want, what you want your days to look like, how many hours you work, what kind of income do you do you get, how many, how much do you have to work to get that income, and then start reverse engineering what your business looks like to get you there. Let's go. All right, I am here with Justin Conico. We go way back. I think we met on Snapchat back, uh, you know, four or five years ago. Um, but there's a lot of cool new stuff that you're working on, man. That that I want to talk to you about. Um, I, I see you growing. Clubhouse is a big part of that, and you've built a really cool real estate brokerage up in Ontario, Canada, that I want to talk about. But welcome to the Massive Agent Podcast. Thanks, Dustin. Uh, first time listener, long time fan, whatever people tend to say <laughs> when they do that. I mean, yes. we've been friends for a long time. And I literally just said to you, I am inspired by the constant growth that you've had on your side and the constant search for growth. So I'm really excited that we're doing this. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. it so we first met through Snapchat, right? Like when when Shannon and Chelsea and and uh, like Bob Wall and, you know, all these people kind of met on Snap, right? Bucky Beeman. I mean, Bucky I think Beeman, we, yeah. I think we all listened to the same Gary V episode where he said everybody was going on Snapchat around the Christmas table and then all jumped on at the same time. And right. yeah, that's where we all met early, early on and the snap pack formed and the, the consistency really took root from there. It's wild to see where everybody's gone since then. It's so cool. I, I have to laugh at people that bless their hearts. They don't know better, but they're, they still in 2021 think that social media is like a separate reality like you know you can't really have like real relationships are built in person right well okay like i understand why they say that but like you and i have a real relationship we just haven't met in person but like is this not real is this not a real conversation you know some of my, the best friends i have on the planet we met online through snapchat or facebook or whatever and and like are those not real relationships it's just it's funny to me it actually makes me think for a second when you're like, we haven't met. I'm like, dude, we haven't met. I'm like, I'm going through my Rolodex. I'm like, right, I feel like crazy. we met a bunch of times, but we have spent hours on the phone off channel talking about strategies, things we're doing. We're both going down the YouTube wormhole very deep right now. You know, I was just sharing with you some off channel courses I'm taking and all the info that I'm going to just share with you. Because again, you're, you're a brother from another mother in that sense where I, you know me better than some people I went to high school with. If that gives people context of how real these relationships can be. Right. I, I love it. Well, I, it's, I can't believe it's taken 173 episodes to get you on here. I know that I had you on Industry Connected early on uh, when I was doing that show, but um, I think the timing for this is perfect. So since Clubhouse dropped, and when was that? Like December, January? I don't even remember. Like four months ago, right-ish? Yeah, the app itself, I think, had been out for over a year, but right. it dropped for us. heavy into our ecosphere. December, I joined, I actually want to say like December 31st, I think, randomly. Really? Apparently what I was doing on New Year's Eve um, yeah, is, is when I joined the app. That sounds about right. Yeah, But since Clubhouse, like you've blown up, um, which is really cool and well-deserved. I feel like there's certain people that Clubhouse was kind of made for, or you were made for it, and you and Shannon Milligan, have exploded through Clubhouse, which is cool. And uh, and then we've also had some discussions about your brokerage and how you guys do business and how you've structured it. And I want to start there because one of the one of the themes of this show, something that I'm, I've really become passionate about since I've been able to find my path forward is 
as a real estate agent, you can do whatever the hell you want as far as how you structure your business. And most agents, I think they get their license and they start by uh, by saying, okay, here's how realtors traditionally operate. Just buy and sell, buy and sell, buy and sell. One deal at a time. When you close it, you're unemployed, got to do it again. And it's just this, this hamster wheel thing. And then they reverse, they start there and they're like, okay, let me build my life around that. Like when I have time for my family, when I have time for this. And, you know, if I want to build wealth and, you know, and have extra income sources, like that all has to revolve around my traditional real estate business. But I think people need to start with what the hell they want their life to look like. What kind of income streams do you want? Do you want diversified revenue? Do you want to work three days a week? Do you want this, that, or the other, and then create a business that, that makes that happen. And so you don't need my permission, but I'll give it to you. You can absolutely do that. It's just backwards. You've done some really cool stuff up in Canada uh, at the prime real estate brokerage. I don't even quite fully understand how your brokerage is different than others, but I know that media is a component. Do you want to kind of, why don't we start with you describing what your brokerage is, how it operates, what it looks like, and, and what you think makes you guys unique about it. Definitely. I'd love to expand on that. And it's always a, a conversation that's changing, right? Clubhouse yes. actually compounded that very quickly because I was able to access people that are doing 10 times the business that I'm doing. And I think one of the reasons we've grown to where we're at is me being able to step back and look at our firm as an ever-evolving group that provides a platform for the people that work here. And I think that's the first thing that I would say about what we do is we're not a sales office, right? We're not anything close to any of the conventional brokerage models that are out there because we don't recruit. So mm. I turn away 15 to 20 people a year. Like in the last month, I've actively been telling people, sorry, we're not hiring right now. And it's a very confusing conversation for real estate agents because the industry standard is you get your license, you look at brokerages, you look at split plans, then you pick where you want to go. And pretty much anywhere is going to have you because you have a license and they take a split of what you make and they process your deals and go on and basically do your business, right? Right. What we wanted to create at Prime was something very, very different. And I guess I'd start as how I look at myself as an agent, because I'm in production, right? I actually love selling houses. I intend on continuing to sell houses. I intend to be the number one agent at this brokerage. I want to be the best agent on the planet. That's what I wake up every day trying to sharpen my skills at. I like people, but I'm also very dialed in on the ones I want to work with, the developers, the builders, the, the buyers, the commercial tenants that are looking for spaces and all these different dynamics of real estate that I fell in love with. But I also realized very early on that if I did want to become the number one agent at the number one brokerage and put up such big volume, ultimately, it's just about chasing numbers. And, you know, I would hire a whole bunch of showing assistants, I'd pay them a salary, and I'd make millions of dollars. Fantastic. I'd make a lot of money, terrible life, my wife's going to hate me, my kid's never going to see me. That's not the life I want. So I identified very early on, I'm not really a real estate agent, I just play one on TV. So I'm licensed to sell houses. What I really enjoy doing is pouring into other people and serving people. So it started with my client base and I loved serving them, but I identified very early on the level of service I wanted to provide them. I needed more than myself. So I needed experts in the different types of real estate transactions that I was trading in to amplify my skills and what I was doing. And I wasn't looking for people to work under me forever. I wasn't looking for agents to come on and just be a buyer agent or a showing agent. And then I still make the bulk of the commission and you know, they go do their thing and they're always going to be a buyer's agent. I wanted people to come into the organization that I could pour into. They could develop their own books of business. You know, essentially I'm teaching them how to fish. They're going out, finding their own fishing spots. Then we're going to fishing spots together and we're just having fun doing it because again, it's a culture of growth rather than a typical model that is just about putting up numbers and, and what's your net income at the end of the day. And how many deals did you sell to get that top spot? So I did away with the entire conventional business model of what it is to run a brokerage. And I created an organization with my wife where we looked at, okay, how do we create a culture that builds people within it through what I just said? Well, the only way that you accomplish that is by having systems and processes in place to give every, the, everybody the ability to amplify what they're doing over and beyond myself. And going into the digital age, this is where the rubber really hits the road. I think, in my opinion, and this is strictly my opinion, there's all kinds of business models out there, 
But I think in the next five to 10 years, all brokerage models are going to be shaken like a coconut tree because you basically have Godzilla versus King Kong happening where you have this tech stack of companies that are trying to take the agent completely out of the transaction. And then you have the conventional business model that keeps the agents in the transaction and holds the information from the consumers. Godzilla versus King Kong is happening, right? Those two guys are fighting over here. The information is going to be public. It's been public in the States since like 2012. Canada's fighting it tooth and nail. We have much more restrictive processes in the real estate industry here, but I can tell you it's already out. Consumers are using the applications. They can see the sold data. We're now seeing in Canada what you guys have seen for years as far as you know, tech stack apps being able to give consumers projected sales prices of homes. We've never had that here, right? right. So again, this is where the conventional industry is fighting tooth and nail against that. And I said in a broker's meeting a month ago to everybody, there's 24 broker owners in this meeting, I'm like, get your head out of the sand. Like the genie's out of the bottle. The consumers are going to have the data. So let's use the tech stack to our advantage now and create different companies and different consumer offerings. But where does that start? It starts with being more than a real estate brokerage. Every single person out there, and I don't care if you sell coffee beans or you're a jujitsu coach or you sell real estate, you're all in sales and marketing. Right. As much as people like to judge real estate agents because we're wearing ties and we're doing videos, selling houses, and people have opinions. Some of us that. are wearing ties. Yeah. Some of us are wearing ties. You're, you're the guy <laughs> the, that the owns better the looking jet. ones. I'm the guy that works for the guy that owns the jet. So <laughs> at the end of the day, though, we're all in sales and marketing. Right. And yes. where I'm going with this is as Godzilla and King Kong are fighting over here, what I want them to do is look over their shoulders and be like, hey, why is Ultron over there playing in the sandbox? And what he's doing? What's he doing? Right, because I'm a non-factor to them. I just have a small little company up in Ontario, Canada. But what we're trying to create here is an organization that really builds the agents, right? My obsession is helping them build their own brands Mm. and then having a system and a network that they can tap into that amplifies what they're doing by 10,000 fold. And the tech stack companies or the conventional companies can't compete with me. Because right. what I'm doing belly to belly with consumers and the traction that we've built and the network that we've built that they can tap into can't be replicated overnight. They can spend as much money as they want. They can get all the leads they want. They can do whatever they want. That's fantastic because that's not the business I'm going after. Right? They'll cannibalize each other. What we're doing is creating very dialed in audiences. And For our agents, to my detriment, I'm creating more audiences that are going to call them directly, not come through the brokerage. So we're not going to get a huge split of the commission, but I don't really care because we do well. But then they're going to feel like, man, like being part of Prime allows me to cultivate and create the life that I want. Prime is helping me put myself on, make more money. They're not really making a lot more for every lead that I'm getting because of how they're helping me build my brand. But there's a level of understanding that truthfully, what we're doing is we are giving more than we're receiving. And if we're doing that with the agents, right? And this is what I've seen. They're better stewards of our industry than anybody I've seen. They're having more fun. They're treating other agents with more respect. They're doing more transactions. And they're looking now at what types of business they can build over and beyond just the transactional business. What you said early on is one of the biggest keys to what we do at Prime is we look at the transactions as part of what they do. But in almost all of our weekly meetings, I'll tell them the real wealth that you're going to make is not going to come from selling real estate. You'll make a lot of money selling real estate, but your real wealth is going to come from the depth of relationships that you make through the real estate that you sell and the media that you get involved with and the communities you get involved with, like Clubhouse, like going out and you know figuring out what your niche is and being involved in that niche. Now, Victor Addis, who just walked by my window, is a great example of that. He's heavily into the pro mountain biking world. I don't Mm. know any of those people. I don't understand that world. I'm old. I'm not going crazy mountain biking anytime soon. But he goes down to Tennessee, takes really cool biking trips. He's vlogging about it. He's killing the real estate industry. He's my condo expert. So if you think about buying a condo, you'll call him. But he's got such a unique dynamic balance to him where you know, I brought him into a file with one of my clients, right? That I could have easily just done the entire deal and kept all the commission with, gave him half the deal. He turned around, ended up structuring a wicked deal for my client to handle something for that developer that was worth way more than the transaction. And then my client called me, we chopped it up. He's like, man, Victor's a killer. And I'm like, yeah, Victor's a killer. 
Like that's what we're doing for our agents, right? We're, we're not even, we don't care about the P and L. We care about if I died tomorrow, is Victor in a better place to succeed? And the answer is yes. Through, again, I don't want to get into this stuff because it's all like the canned real estate stuff that you hear, but through the training, right? Through how we actually prepare him to succeed in this industry, Mm -hmm. through the accountability, how we train him to structure their calendars, how to use productivity hacks to do more in less time, how to, you know, qualify and work with clients because I've, I've had my 10,000 hours in and they get the access to, to that, to rocket themselves into a, basically a position where they may have only been in the industry for two or three years, but they're running circles around people that have been in the industry for 25 years. And then the last piece, which is amplifying what they're doing from a brand perspective with the stuff that you and I have spent years, years and years learning and constantly learning to do. We take that, we bring it back to the well. You do it for your crew and the whole team that you've built. You're out there, you're on the mats, you're getting your black belt and you're bringing it back to the team and you're sharing it with them. To me, that is such an intangible That's value. Y- you can't quantify it and you, yeah. can't, you can't create a tech stack around it because they can't just go out and be like, oh, look, this is popping off on, on Twitter or TikTok. Like, there's no tech company that's going to turn around and just be able to give that to somebody like you or I would, in my opinion the only thing they can do is just continue to spoon feed leads, but that doesn't really teach you much. I I firmly believe, and I I don't even think this is debatable. I I think this is just a fact of business. If you, no matter what the hell you do, whether you're a dentist, a jujitsu instructor, like you said, or a restaurant owner or or a realtor, if you do not have control over your ability to get new business, you're done. Mm -hmm. You may not be done for 10 years, but at some point you're done. And if you're, if you are part of one of these tech companies or a brokerage that spoon feeds you, but they don't teach you how to do it your damn self, you're screwed because you're always reliant on them. Like, and I don't want to be reliant on anybody. And so that's why I think what, what you're doing at your brokerage is so key. And the word keep, kept coming to my mind as you were describing that retention. Mm-hmm. I, I think the brokerages that are going to win in a very big way are focused on retention and that could be seen you know with a with a selfish connotation but so what like the business needs to retain its people and it does that by bringing them up but also not bringing them up to leave you know that there's a lot of brokerages that when they do what they should be doing and they train an agent to be great the agent's like oh, don't need you anymore or i don't need this team anymore i'm gone mm. and that's what they should do. Right. Uh, but you you're creating something where you bring them up and you're, you're creating a dream team almost. And so that's great for retention. I imagine you guys don't have very much turnover at all. Is that fair? Yeah, it is very fair. Um, we were in this conversation last night and we were talking about retention. There's only one agent that ever left and I fired him because he did something that he shouldn't have done with a, a team member that spoke to the guy's ethics. And he was a producer. He was actually making us a lot of money but he wanted half of something that didn't belong to him. And that just gave me an indication of his character. So I let him go on the spot. We've had a couple other agents that we've parted ways with, but usually they're not just, they're not in the business for real estate anymore. And we're not interested in people being on our roster that aren't actually transacting because it speaks to the brand, right? We just want you to see, I don't want prime to be the brand per se. I just want it to be the cosign. So if you're a consumer and you see it, you're like, Oh, they're with prime. They're solid. They, they know what they're doing from, you know, a media and a marketing perspective. They're yes. super ethical. They're the best in the business. That's the only thing I care about. I actually tell my agents, develop your own color palette, develop your own fonts, and we help them with that. So the prime media agency side of the business actually sits down and does digital brand strategies with them, does deep, deep dives into who they are, and we help them formulate a brand that's actually not necessarily lined up with ours. That's a separate conversation. But what you said about retention is key. And it all comes stems from leadership. Because if I was, and I've told this to my agents' faces, I'm like, if I wasn't going out and refining my skill set and trying to grow and going to bring more food to the table for the team and investing more infrastructure into the company and building these extra companies and adding things, they should leave me. Because if they're with me for a year and they learn everything that I, I do and how I do it, go off and go to somewhere else. Yeah, you'll probably do better without me. The difference is they'll never be able to catch me because I'm never going to stop. So the things that I'm working on now may seem insane to them, but it's because people like yourself and I are looking two, three, four, five years ahead because that's what we're called to do in the position that we happen to be in, 
right? Thankfully, I have my wife to hold me down. Otherwise, I would be on the moon because I, I am a bit of a dreamer. But at the same time, it fills me up to no extent to do that. And then to come back to the team, lay it on the table, chop it up with them in the huddles that we do and the meetings that we, we did a, an office meeting on jet skis last summer. We actually vlogged it and just talk about, man, what are we struggling with? Like, how's our pricing model? How's our listing presentations? Okay. We should refine that. How do we, how do we present to developers and builders? How do we launch a project? It doesn't even feel like work because I'm sitting down with friends, getting excited and passionate about stuff that on the other side of the coin can be miserable. This mm -hmm. business can be so lonely, man. Like I enjoy what I do, which is why I want to be in production. I'm very dialed in on the clients I want to work with because it doesn't feel like work. But what you said at the very beginning of this episode is what I want everybody to write down four times on their notepad. You need to establish what's the life that you want. And then you need to build a business that supports that lifestyle because everybody does the opposite. They get on the hamster wheel. They're like, I got to get a job. You know, they come out of school. They go work for a company. They work for 25 years. They hate their life. They're miserable at work. They come home. They take it out on their family. Who are the people that should be getting 150% of them? And they don't, right? And I'm not perfect by any means. I'm sure there's times that I fail. The difference is people like yourself and I will audit ourselves, look in the mirror and have those hard conversations and make the changes we want to make to be the people that we want to be. So I would say to anybody that wants to start that, it doesn't even start with quitting your job and just starting from scratch. I mean, just look at your work week. And this is something that we do as a team collectively is we discuss what are the things that fill your cup? Are they in your calendar? I like fishing, not at a place in my life where I can go fishing for six hours a day, three days a week, just not going to happen. So I established in my life once every three to four months, I'll hit the water for two or three hours really early. And I'll go on like one really cool fishing trip a year. Awesome. That's enough to fill my cup, goes in my calendar. Next thing, health and fitness. You know, I work out, you're a beast right now too, killing it, you're motivating me. That goes in my calendar, five days a week, two rest days. Now my, my dietary diet and all that stuff goes in my calendar as well. Okay, now where are my pockets? Let's talk about my family. Let's talk about those things. Let's fill my calendar with everything that fills me up. Now look at how much time I have to work and what do I want to accomplish in my work and start compartmentalizing what you can actually do to track to your ambitions. And then sometimes I'm taking stuff out and putting things in and I'm, I'm auditing how full all of those cups are. And if I'm in amazing shape and I'm working out, you know, four hours a day, every single day for five days, well, maybe I'm going to dial that back and add some more work in there because I need to get some more projects or I'm trying to grow my YouTube channel, or whatever. But I, I think people don't actually realize that this is doable, both right. from an ambition perspective, a work perspective, and they, they just don't do the work to do it. So yeah, I, I think you can definitely create a, a world and a job that fills you up. It just takes a little bit of thinking and planning to do it. it. This is why these conversations are so key because hearing how you structure your business and hearing how I structure mine and what my priorities are and what yours are can help people start to understand, okay, like there's no one right way to do this. Because when I, I've been an agent for 10 years, when I first got my license, I literally thought there was one path. I, th mm -hmm. I thought that the path of success is you, you get your license, you sell a bunch of homes, then you become a broker, and then you start your own brokerage. I had no concept of anything else. And so that was my plan. And then, you know, four or five, six years ago, I start hearing about teams, you know, that, that Keller Williams really popularized. And, and it's like, wait a minute, that everything that I'd the reason why I'd want a brokerage, I could get with a team, but then the brokerage handles all the bullshit, like the, you know, the, the legal stuff, the, you know, all the stuff. Right. So I'm like, well, that's interesting. I guess I don't really want a brokerage. I'd rather have a team. And then I started learning about another structure with, with my brokerage and revenue share, where now instead of me having a team that I have to manage, I can mentor and coach and be a resource to, and a partner of these agents, but I'm never their boss. I'm never concerning myself of, Hey, are there, are they calling those leads back or not? Are they doing this, that, or the other? If they're not, that sucks, but like they're in business for themselves, just not by themselves. So I had this natural progression, but it took looking 
and and seeing what else is out there. And then what, what you guys are doing, you're like, hey, we are doing our brokerage, but we're going to do it this way so that it works for us, so that we're stoked about it over all these other models. And so it starts with knowing what you want your life and your business to look like. It, I can't have enough of these conversations. I think it's so crucial. Uh, and I, I believe the vast majority of our industry is still on the path that I was on when I first came into the industry with tr trying to chase units sold. Like, I get it. I understand why the number of properties you sell is important, but it's a very incomplete metric. I don't know about you. I mean, I'll just be blunt. If I sold one home a year or zero, but but my revenue was where I wanted it to be, that's all I care about. I I don't want to sell 60 homes to make X amount. I'd rather sell one or two or five. You know what I mean? Like for me, I'm in it for the business, the, the business and the freedom that that gives me. Um, I, I don't know. It, Agents almost, it's, it's like they need permission to, to, to think this way and you don't, but I'll give it to you. If you want the permission, there you go. Um, let's talk a little bit more about, about prime. You guys focus a lot on media. Um, when you are training newer or inexperienced agents up, um, it's cool that you want them to be rock stars within your organization. So not just like, you know, under your shadow, right? Yeah. Like, like so many other teams, brokerages, organizations. Uh, what do you do media wise to cultivate that? And a second part, and I know this could be a 30 minute answer. So <laughs> try, try not to let it. Um, what, what do you guys do for your clients that you think is very unique to, to your brokerage? So yeah, you can tell that I get excited when I talk to Dustin because I can ramble on and this could be probably an hour and a half uh, long answer. When it comes to agents coming to the brokerage, the first thing is we don't actually require them to do anything. Somebody asked me recently, do they have to have an aptitude for social media? I'm like, not at all. Like a lot of our agents don't do any social media. But what we do as a brokerage is we do a lot of it for them. So even when they're here, Give you an example, we have a shooter in here on a fairly regular basis and we're pumping out micro content for them and we're gonna ramp that up significantly because I realize that it, it is getting a lot of traction with the ones that wanna do it and we're making it easier for them to understand how to pose. And the other thing is I, I lead by example, right? We talked about leadership. I mean, that's, that's everything, right? You're leading by example in your organization and I wake up every day thinking, how can I lead by example? Are the actions that I'm taking tracking to the promises that I made to these people when they came here? And a lot of the things that I'm doing that they think are out of reach, I had a 40 minute conversation with one, one of my agents today about how I struggle putting out content. I looked at my camera for literally probably four hours yesterday, not like sitting there looking at it for four hours, but I knew I had to put a piece of content out and I was just in my own head about it. And I was doing 10 different things. And I, I kind of share that journey. I share how I do things. So, you know, I was telling Victor again, who's in the office right now, who's going heavy into YouTube strategies that I'm learning where again, the normal mindset when it comes to this business or the world in general is, why would I share my secrets with you? You know, I'm trying to grow my channel. You're trying to go yours. Jazz is trying to grow his. I put out about a week and a half ago, I think that my goal for the next year is 100K subscribers in the next year. Jazz is doing the exact same thing. Guess what? If he gets 100,000, I get 200,000 or 100,000, that's 200,000 together. Then Dustin comes in and that's 300,000. Like it's a different world now than it's ever been where the more we do together, the more we do together. So I think when you ask about, you know, what we do for our agents on the media side is I find something that scratches my itch and the trickle down effect that hits all of our agents makes them by attrition want to do more. And the more that they do it, they realize that it's a real thing and they're, they're getting these come list me calls that I don't want a piece of because it came through their brand or their network or everything else. So we're teaching them how to do it by example. And then we're giving them the tools on how to do it by the fact that we own the production company and the agency. And we're actually pouring into that. So the production company and the agency started off as just me, huge ad spend, tons of equipment. I do a ton of media on myself, but we formulated two companies to, to run that under because they're essentially two companies, right? And this goes to the conversation about what do we do for our clients? We do something nobody else can do because of the fact that we're not a real estate brokerage, right? So when they hire us, they're getting three companies. They're getting prime real estate, prime media productions, and the agency side. So we can formulate a, a digital strategy for their property specific to their property 
establish exactly who we're going to sell it to. We can do the production work to identify that consumer and story tell to that consumer. And then we can actually run ads against that exact consumer set. The other thing we can do that nobody else can touch us on is because we've been doing it for a decade, I have all that data. So think about all of the consumer data I have, Dustin. You have a beautiful property to sell in Grand Bend, Ontario. It's lakefront. Guess what? I've been running ads for a decade in Grand Bend. I have all of that ad set of all the people who ever interacted with any of my Grand Bend videos. And guess what I can do? I can run a custom audience targeted set, not to those people, although I can advertise to those people because they've clicked on my ads. I can tell Facebook and Google, go find me more people like these people. So nobody can replicate that because they haven't been running those ads for the last 10 years. But I created the sauce and I used to sit up at night on Saturday nights learning these things and doing them myself. Now I'm putting smarter people than me in place and connected with smarter people than me to teach them how to take that now that maybe I have my blue belt in and get to that black belt level. So I guess I'll, I'll wrap up my 30 minute answer in a nice little bow saying, you know, I created a solution for what I wanted that didn't exist in the industry, sharing it with my team and my entire community, whether you work for me or not, I'll probably give you a ton of secrets on how I do things just because I think it makes us better by nature and it forces our industry to scale up. And then for my clients, I'm trying to create the best real estate selling system on the planet. So if you think real estate, you think prime. That sounds like a shameless plug, but that's essentially what I'm trying to do. Totally shameless, but it, but it's warranted. <laughs> um, it, yeah, man, I love how you've you've put so much thought into it, and you you iterate, you you make adjustments, you change because the landscape changes. What consumers want and expect changes. What we as agents want and expect changes. What uh, you know the different technology tools that are out there changes our competition and what they offer changes. Like it all changes. And, and it's, it's just funny to me how there's still agents that have been doing literally the same shit in the same place for 10, 15, 20 years. And they wonder why slowly their, their business is going down. Their, the referrals that they used to rely on exclusively are drying up. I've had so many conversations with agents and, and they're sad. Um, th these are sad conversations because they're like, I don't know what to do. They don't have a clue how to get their own business. Yeah. They just, they were coasting off referrals for the last decade. Those referrals are now going with a Zillow or a Homey or, or an open door, or some app, you know, or a for sale by owner or whatever. Cause now like consumers are empowered. Uh, it's like, gonna, I apologize to cut you off, but it's a topic that excites me. Right. Because I do yeah. think it's going to be the great leveler. Mm -hmm. And unless you know, and that's why I'm equipping these people is I might die tomorrow. And if I didn't impact people beyond the money I made, what's it all for? There's, there's no point, right? If, if I can leave you with one thing that impacts your life and I'm gone tomorrow, you're probably going to show up at my funeral, right? And I know you and I have listened to Gary Vee for years. And I think being around people like that it really changes your mindset in what you're doing it for and gives you a sense of satisfaction that, fact that you and your wife have your diet dialed in to me, super important because probably just makes you better at, at life, makes you more passionate about your relationship with her, makes you a more fun person to be around, makes me want to do the same thing with my wife, right? Like because I've, a lot of my focus has been on the business side, I've let a lot of that side of things kind of fall off, right? So I think, sure. you know, you're surrounded by people that inspire you and then you're inspired to do other things, right? It, I mean, life is life. Work is, work is part of that but it's not the everything. And I, I love how you're inspiring people through your podcast. Every time I run into you, you know, when we share stages together, or I listen to you speak, it's like, you're shaking people and just saying there's more, like there's more. And I think the tech stack and the world is just going to amplify and make that happen a lot quicker than people realize. A hundred percent. You said something in the beginning that I, I wanted to clarify, or I, I think I know the answer, but I don't think most of our audience does. Is Zillow, in Canada, do you guys even have Zillow they up just, there? They just got here, um, yeah. So, and they're technically a brokerage, and we actually have yeah. like anti-competitiveness uh, legislation here that I can't even speak about them because if I do, then they can actually take me to Rico. I don't care about Zillow; they're not a factor you can't, to me. You can't speak in general, like mention their existence, or you can't speak negatively. Negatively, about. yeah, right. you can't speak That's negatively. That's how it is here, right? Too. Yeah. yeah, okay, I didn't know because I've been in in places where people are talking pretty brutally about uh, business models and open forums, right? right. You know, 
to me, it's a different thing. But you know, when I look at what they do, I'm not in the same business as Zillow. But then truthfully, I'm not in the same business as the standard brokerage model. I'm not in competition with right. them because I don't recruit. It's very confusing to other brokers when I'm constantly sending people to other brokers. I'll CC them on an email to people that want to come here. And I'll tell them, oh, we're not hiring. And then I'll CC them to the local offices and say, hey, this is somebody that just got out of school. They'd be great for your, your outfit. I'm sure it confuses the heck out of the other brokers. But again, I'm not in the same business as them. I just I'm You've made a little different. Ivy League, so to speak. Like you're, <laughs> you're, you're like an Ivy League school um, within the industry or, or a, a skull and bone society. How about that? I, I just building another sandbox. <laughs> like I said, I yes. like to think of myself as just build like a lot simpler than an I, Ivy league school. Just, just a different thing. It's nothing that I've seen, but I, I didn't have anything that I was excited about when I came in the industry. So my wife decided it's a good idea to just create it and kudos to her. Cause I probably never would have done it without her. I, now, I've never met her. I don't even think I've, I've spoken to her. But what I hear from you is you guys are a very good fit because your weaknesses are her strengths and vice versa. Um, you know, I assume there's there's probably, it, has it still been a bumpy ride or has it been fairly seamless since you guys uh, launched your your company? Life is bumpy, my friend. You know that. <laughs> I think yes. if you're not going through discomfort, you're not actually building anything of significant significance. But then I had days like today where she called me and we've got super dialed in on our admin meetings. And she called me, we had a conversation about, you know, changing some things on the contracts to our agent's benefit. We realized that we were charging two transaction fees when they were sharing in-house brokerage th things. And I'm like, no, that doesn't make any sense. I wouldn't want that. So we just changed it. We're going to probably lose a couple thousand dollars this year. But again, we, we talk about giving more than we take and it's fair. So we're changing mm -hmm. it. But she dealt with that, called me, we had chopped it up. And I just told her, I'm like, man, I appreciate you and the team so much because I was out here doing this, you did that. I mean, thank you. Like that's enabling me to be a better leader, but there's other times where we've had knockout drag out arguments about things that I see from an agent's perspective and she sees from a broker's perspective. And I think that's where the real magic has happened is we brought to table things. Nobody wants to talk about in this business. And she's, she actually went to an Ivy league business school. She went to the Richard Ivy school of business incredibly smart, ran a consulting company. She, she's not a social girl. She doesn't have anything on social media. We don't post anything. My daughter on social media. I'm actually probably the most private public figure you've ever seen, but we made that decision early on. And I've always been out there in front of people, right? I ran restaurants. It's always been my thing. And I used to be an introvert, but I became an introvert by attrition. So I think the dynamic of having somebody that you don't get your ego all tied up in the fact that you don't necessarily agree on a topic has been incredibly powerful in our growth mm. because we'll have those hard discussions and I'll get heated. I'm clearly an excitable guy. My energy level in this meeting's probably gone up 15 different times at 15 different points. And she's very stoic, like very stoic, not like this at all. So it's balanced me and it's enabled us to have that, that person that you can talk to and, and be vulnerable with about why you feel one way or another about things. So I'd encourage anybody that you know has a spouse or a business partner that you don't see eye, eye with, pour into that and put your ego aside when you're having those discussions and, and over communicate when you are wrong. And you know, when you're bringing your emotions into a business conversation, because that can happen as well, too. Absolutely. There's, there's two things I want to get to. I want to do it. I want to talk about clubhouse for a minute and then do a rapid fire questions before we wrap it up. Sure. Um, but your wife sounds like the real boss. She sounds like the, the one that's really Legit. in charge and, and steering she the is. ship and trying to keep you from bouncing off the walls. She's that's trying to stop wife. me from spending money and I'm trying to buy more headphones and microphones right. and do more courses. And yeah, oh, it's a lot of fun. She's, she's awesome. She's yeah, integral to what we do here. That's a good yin and yang. All right. Clubhouse. Um, do you think that it's died off a little bit? You know, like the, 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 that initial, like, like my first few days, I spent 16 hours for like a couple straight days on Clubhouse because it was just so like impressive and fun and enjoyable. I feel like that's cooled off quite a bit for most people, but there's still a ton of value. How have you, if you can, in, in just, you know, two or three minutes, how has Clubhouse really changed, you know, how you do business or, or even just your stature, you know, in the industry? 
So, so I'll break it down to a few pieces. Um, from a growth perspective, I mean, it drove more off channel growth than any platform I've ever seen. I don't know what happened or why it's happening to me, but I tended, I got a lot of traction on the app early on. And like, I would just see this constant growth and I was kind of confused as to why it was happening. Cause I wasn't doing anything special to make it happen, but it's continued. And what it did was it took a lot of that audience from clubhouse and drove it to Instagram. So my Instagram account like doubled in the last four months. And it's continued to ramp up over and over and over. And I think the reason that that is, is Clubhouse really dials in your audience, right? If you're trying to grow on YouTube, you're trying to go on Clubhouse, you're trying to grow on Instagram, the best thing you can do is get around like-minded people, tell the algorithm who's going to like your content. And then as those people interact with your content, it finds more people like them. So what I talked about doing with ads for sellers is what the algorithms want to do. You just kind of got to let them do what they want to do, which is why buying followers is a bad idea because you're buying a big chunk of followers that could care less about your content and you're just going to tank your account. So Clubhouse amplified my audience by giving me people that like my content because I'm speaking to that community. As far as it dying off in terms of the excitement about it, I went through like three phases with Clubhouse. One where I had no idea what I was doing. I was just showing up in rooms, jumping on stages, didn't understand the etiquette, didn't understand what the mic flash was. But I spent a lot of time on the app learning from people much smarter than me. So shout out to William Tong. He was like the first dude I found on Clubhouse that kind of took me under his wing and taught me a lot of things that enabled me to get into a really tight group of people that I still fall around with to this day. What I mean by that is I got a group of people that I know are in it for the right reasons. They're not running straight up sales funnels to do coaching and do all these different things they're actually just giving a lot of value and we're using it as a mini mastermind. So to give you an idea, like Andy C, who's like on pace to do a billion dollars in Silicon Valley this year, we chop it up like two or three times a day, like on his way to appointments, he loses appointments, loses meetings. We're talking about strategies. He's talking about direct mail. He does no digital. I'm talking about digital mm-hmm. and some systems we're doing. Amanda Dahl jumps in, talks about operations. I'm doing it consistently. Again, going back to uh, create the life you want, it's time blocked. So the rooms that I'm in are very consistent and they're the same rooms on a regular basis. So it's very manageable for me, but it's like a live podcast or radio show. Like last night, I didn't go on the real estate broker's lounge. I'm normally there every single night. I want to spend time with my family. So I shut it down. I I did something else, whatever. No, No stress, no press, because that group of people are still going to be there tomorrow, right? But I run my show every Monday, 1130 to... 1230 and I bring guests on and that's just a super passionate thing there too. So it really has helped me from a consistency perspective and then changing my business again, exactly what I just said, masterminding with a guy like Andy T changed my game a hundred percent. Wait till you see us next year. Right. The, the, the access that you have to others is crazy. Um, and, and there's, there's deals happening there. Glenn Sanford, the founder of EXP met Grant Cardone on clubhouse. It, and they were able to actually talk to each other. And now they've done a deal together. Grant Cardone's getting involved with the EXP. Uh, to, you know, there's, there's some business relationship there. And it started through a clubhouse conversation. It's, it's just crazy. And other people are able to chime in and, and join that conversation as well. Um, all right, real quick. I want to do the rapid fire questions rapidly. Because uh, I, I got another call here in just, a, in just two minutes. Either or questions, pick one or the other. You don't need to elaborate unless you want to. And then at the end, we'll let people know where they can find you, which of course they can always go to the show notes on the podcast or the description of YouTube. And then we'll wrap it up, my friend. Facebook or Instagram? Instagram. Instagram or LinkedIn? Instagram. Books or podcasts? Podcasts. Podcasts or audiobooks? Podcasts. iPhone or Android? iPhone. Alexa or Google Home? Google Home. Oh. Burgers or pizza? Pizza. I'm a big pizza fan. Hell yes. I'm a big burger fan. I like both. And yeah, that's, I like everything. Maybe that's a problem. <laughs> New York or LA? New York. Love it. NFL or NBA? Nah, NFL. NFL or hockey? Hockey. Come on. Yeah. Canadian. You're Canadian. Right, right. I mean, stereotypes are stereotypes come from a real place. Yeah, let's, sure. let's be honest. <laughs> uh, mountains or beach? Beach. Podcasts or vlogs? Vlogs. YouTube or Facebook Live? YouTube. Rich dad, poor dad, or millionaire real estate agent? Neither. Okay. Uber or Lyft? Uber. Oh, you want to elaborate on the last one? Uh, I'll pick the Bible. Yeah, I just some of the concepts that I have are, are 
further thinking um, than either book. Rich Dad, Poor Dad would be the one that I would read if I had to. I just, Millionaire Real Estate Agent doesn't do it for me. Yeah, I, I hear you. Gary V or Grant Cardone? Gary V all day. And I was about to ask the most impactful book you've ever read, but that would be? The Bible, for right. sure. I'm still reading it every day. Every time I read it, I learn something new. It really is a great personal development book. You know, if, if you, you look at it that way. Um, awesome. All right, my friend, where can they find you? Where can everybody find you and follow you and see what you're up to? So go to my IG, justin.konikow. Everything stems from there. And go subscribe to my YouTube channel. That is my goal for next year, 100K followers. And last thing, go to Dustin's podcast. Give it a five-star review, man. He puts so much effort into this. It's the least you could do. Thanks, my friend. Appreciate it. Good stuff today. Always love talking to you. Thanks for your time. Um, thanks again, man. Talk All to you love, soon. love, man. You're one of the best out there. And keep hammering. I'm super, super proud to be your friend. Thanks, brother. All right. See ya. 